So thanks everyone for logging in to our webinar today, When Grand Families Are Supported, Young Children Thrive. I'm Pamela Trivedi. I'm the Infant and Early Childhood Transformation Team Lead for our National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Child, Youth and Family Mental Health, or NTAC. And we're really super excited to, um, to hear from our presenters today on this topic about grand families. Um, our, present, our great presenters are gonna define the term um, for us. Um, so I'll, I'll let them do that. Um, I just had a couple of introductory slides before I introduce our wonderful presenters today. Next slide, please. <laughs> So this is just our disclaimer for those of you who've been on our programming before. Um, we are, our, our National Training and Technical Assistance Center is funded by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which federally is part of HHS, Health and U the US Department of Health and Human Services. And the disclaimer is that the views presented here are the views of the presenter and not of any of our federal colleagues. Next slide, please. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please, please, please. Um, so NTAC is, for those of you who have been um, involved with our programming before, NTAC is part of a great multidisciplinary team. We have some excellent partners who are contributing to NTAC. My, I, I'm from the um, Center for Child and Human Development at Georgetown. One of our presenters today, um, Jane Walker is from the Family Run Executive Director Leadership Organization. So she brings to us um, her, Fredla and their organization and Jane bring, bring to us just many wonderful folks um, with lived experience uh, in the family advocacy community, including our other presenter, Dr. Glenda Clare today. We also have some wonderful colleagues from um, the youth advocacy community involved in Youth Move Ma National um, Change Matrix, which is a wonderful organization of um, kind of commu community informed researchers, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, and CARS, who helps us keep all the trains running at NTAC and provides all the technical support and administrative support for our work. Um, next slide, please. So our goal at NTAC is for that all children, youth, young adults, and their families with emotional and behavioral health needs can access evidence-based treatment and recovery services in a well-coordinated system of care. Um, we know that folks have been working on the systems to pair approach that coordinates services and supports around children with behavioral health needs for a long time. Um, and you know, we're happy to support and connect with grantees who are engaged with this work and um, you know, allied professionals in um, different parts of systems that are related to children's behavioral health. Next slide, please. So, and hopefully the folks that are logging in for this call, um, there'll be folks that are well represented in, um, in these sort of categories of providers and cross sector partners. So we help state and local, we help and serve state and local agency leaders, the mental health workforce, including on our team, sort of the early childhood mental health workforce, um, which consists of people working on prevention and promotion in early care and education settings, in addition to um, consultants, social workers, clinicians, home visitors, um, primary care providers who are coordinated into behavioral health systems, school-based providers, um, family and youth partners, peer support providers, and peer supervisors are just kind of examples of folks in systems that we work with and serve. Next slide, please. And here's a nice, super nice infographic um, that was put together just to describe the types of trainings and supports that we offer. So this, this webinar is part of a, you know, a learning opportunity that we're offering. We also do some more cohort-based learning in the form of our communities of practice, which are a number of sessions on a related topic where we can all learn together. For those of you who have been on our in our events before, we are probably jamming up your inbox with lots of resources in the form of our five things digest. And this year, in year two of our programming, we are getting into other kinds of multimedia, such as podcasts and interactive curricula. Um, and we also offer customized coaching and individual training, uh, training and technical assistance and consultation. So um, I think. Our colleague Joanne just chatted into the chat or pasted into the chat our 
a request in case you want any individual support from us on this topic or or other topics. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to let our presenters go through the objectives for today's um, for today's webinar. But I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about our excellent presenters today. So first we have, and I think that um, Joanne is going to spotlight them in a moment here. First, we have Jane Walker, who's one of our um, partners for NTAC. Jane Walker is from FREDLA. I just read that acronym before, but I'll read it again. The Family Run Executive Director Leadership Association, um, which is a wonderful organization that Jane was one of the found that Jane was the founder of, and Jane has founded more than one family advocacy organization. She's now a senior advisor to FREDLA. Um, Jane's background is in um, clinical social work and family advocacy. She's, I just mentioned she started more than one family advocacy organization. Um, she's just provided, uh, she's been such an excellent presence in the family ad advocacy and nonprofit world um, and kind of brings to all of our interactions her very rich lived experience of, of you know, decades of raising um, a child who's now an adult with special health care needs. Um, so, we're really excited to continue to work with Jane and all of our programming um, and work with her today on this webinar. Also really excited to um, introduce Dr. Glenda Clare, who's our speaker today, who's the founder of the Fragile Families Network. So Dr. Clare has served as head of a grand family and, and Dr. Clare and Jane are gonna help us understand what a grand family is. Um, Dr. Clare has some excellent lived experience that she um, acquired through becoming the legal guardian of her cousin's child, um, you know, several years ago. And Dr. Claire also brings to um, this experience and the teach all of the teaching and training she does, her background as a licensed behavioral health professional, health educator, certified coach, TA provider, author and speaker, just a super accomplished um, practitioner that we're really happy to be in, con in contact with today. Um, academically, Dr. Claire's background um, and her graduate degrees are in counseling and um, career counseling. So without further ado, I wanna go ahead and turn it over to Jane to get us started on this webinar, but just wanted to extend a warm welcome to all of you who logged in today. Go ahead, Jane. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you for that. Um, introduction and um, we have a wonderful turnout for today. So I think that speaks to the uh, interest and the need uh, around this topic. So as um, as Pamela mentioned, our, our uh, objectives you can see up there on the screen. I don't think we need to go through them uh, one by one, but we really want to raise awareness about the needs of grand families and also the children that they're raising, as well as really um, help to promote uh, connection with fam grand families and to uh, stimulate more and more programs and a grand family friendly policies. Next slide. So, before we begin, uh, grandparents and relatives uh, around the country are stepping up to fill the gap when parents can no longer provide care for their children. The term grand families, which Dr. Claire will be talking about much, much more depth, but that term has been used to describe this new family group. And um, more and more, children are being raised in these households. About 7.8 million children across the country live in households headed by a grand family ahead and about 2.5 million grandparents or relatives report they're responsible for their grandchildren's needs. And about a third of these homes, uh, neither the children's parents are present. Often this is a result of traumatic events, such as the death of the children's parents, substance use, sexual abuse, parental incar uh, incarceration, or chronic neglect. Uh, to those of you on the call who may be 
the head of a grand family, uh, we honor you and we appreciate your caring for the these children who um, otherwise might not have all of the um, care and love that they need and deserve. So we really take our hats off to you today. I myself have witnessed my uh, brother's family and they're raising uh, two grandchildren. So I, I know that um, it's um, a challenge, but also a blessing. So thank you to all of you. So with that, it's indeed my pleasure to really um, let Dr. Glenda Claire share with us her both experience and expertise in this area. So uh, Dr. Claire, would you like to begin by just saying a few words about your experience? Sure. Um, I'd like to first start in terms of why I'm here. And I'm here because of my mentor, Jane Walker, um, you know, because of my experience, one of the things that I decided that I wanted to do was to develop a program to help ser serve grand families. And I went to Fredla and said, help. And there was a chain providing help. Yeah. But let me go ahead and give you my definition of a grand family. A grand family is created when a grandparent or other family member raises the child of a relative unable or unwilling to parent. I think it's really important for people to know that it's not just grandparents doing this. There are siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins, fictive kin that are stepping up. In my case, in 2003, I went to my aunt's funeral and I was hearing that three children in my family were gonna go into foster care. And I said, well, we got family. Why would they go into foster care? And so we stepped up to um, take on that role. One thing I want you to know in terms of, and this is a Dr. Glenda Claire thing. I know that there are children within the foster care system and there are children outside of the foster care system. I'm looking at um, the inbox with, from the chat and what have you. So I'm seeing that there are a lot of people that are coming from different organizations. Some of them are child welfare. Some of them are outside of child welfare. What I want you to know is that the majority of children that are living with their relatives are not in the foster care system. Right. And I also want you to know that they don't want to be in the foster care system. Child welfare system, a lot of them step up to assume the role because they wanna keep the child out of the foster care system. So there's a lot of dynamics with that. I use the term grand family to encompass people within the system and outside of the system. Kinship care, when I think of kinship care, I just think of um, people within the system. That's my definition. Other people may differ. That's how I kind of keep them straight. So in the United States, just like Jane said, there are a lot of young people that are living in foster, um, that are living with relatives. She gave you um, some, some specific stats. I want you to see at the bottom of this page, there is um, information with a website on where you can get information specific to your state. Okay, Jane, let's go ahead and roll with those questions that you have for us. All right. So what do you see as the impact for heads of grand families and uh, caregivers in terms of their own life at, uh, as they take on this role? Okay, the first thing I want to say is that nobody wants to raise their relative's children. That's, that's, that's not why anybody gets, gets into this. When the child was born, nobody said, oh, wow, you just had a child. I want to raise that child. That's not why people get involved in this. <laughs> they get involved because, as Jane mentioned earlier, there's loss. Something has happened. Something catastrophic has happened. She mentioned death. Um, suicide, substance abuse, incarceration, domestic violence, all of those are things that we don't typically want to see. And those things have a significant impact on the caregiver, the child, and actually even the birth parent, if the birth parent is alive. So all of those things, we have all of these feelings. There are feelings of sadness, confusion, ambivalence, guilt, 
loyalty issues. The loyalty issues are, they, they can tear a family apart, the loyalty issues, because here's the thing, think of it. Children generally wanna live with their parents, right? So when the child is not with his or her parent and somebody else is raising them and the child knows that the parent is there, they've got some loyalty issues. Grandma, sister, cousin, their first relationship was with that birth parent. And so having that child, having custody of that child also creates some loyalty issues for them. People often ask, why don't people want to, um, why don't they want to be licensed? Why don't they want to adopt the child? Well, if I adopt the child, that brings up some other kind of dynamics in my family. In terms of grandparents, and I wasn't a grandparent, I was a cousin. Bringing my cousin home to live with me meant that there were things that I had intended to do that I could no longer do anymore. So grandparents, for instance, they're ready to retire. They may not be able to retire anymore. Trips that they wanted to take, things that they were saving for, all of those kinds of things come into play. There's a lot of issues that come up when you are raising a relative's child. For me, I was single and I was living my career. My career changed because then I'm now raising a young child. And so I had to learn some things I didn't know about. The education system, I was flabbergasted when I found out that, what, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What do you mean she goes to school? I, I, I've got to find somewhere for her to be when I need to drive to work in the morning because school, she's got to be somewhere until school opens. And then in the evening, then I, I didn't get out of work at three o'clock in the afternoon. I didn't get out at two. So I had to find somewhere for her to be. Families um, that, that live in apartments or condos, especially the older families, if you're living in a senior community, senior, senior communities don't want children there. So well, that means you got to move. Um, the legalities. So you are now bringing someone into your household. Did you know the schools don't let you just come into the school? You got to bring some paperwork with you. In terms of um, medical issues, you got to bring some paperwork with you, something to prove that this child is supposed to be with you. A lot of people don't go to court. Now, I did, I was advised. Um, by people in my family network that I needed to get guardianship. Everybody doesn't get that advice. So that means that they don't have formal paperwork. And so they've got a lot of things to figure out. So there are all of these things now coming up at the same time, grief, loss, confusion. What do I do about healthcare? What do I do about dental care? How am I gonna handle all of this financially? If the child has a disability or if the caregiver has a disability, how do we handle those kinds of things? Young children, young children are the subject of this particular webinar. Young children often don't have the words to verbalize what they're feeling. So what happens? They act that out. So all of that comes into play in terms of um, bringing these families together. Everybody is impacted. Um, I know that often we just look at the caregivers and the children, but here's the thing about grand families. You don't lose the birth parents unless they are dead. They are still there. They know how to access you. You probably know how to access them. So all of these things interplay with three levels, the birth parent, the kinship provider, and then the child. All of these feelings that you see here. Wow, what you describe is so complex in so many ways and on so many levels, you know, as it relates to the emotional, financial, um, social, in terms of the interactions with your other family members, change those dynamics, 
but also then with the system. You mentioned schools, you mentioned legal system, healthcare, all those kinds of things. So what you've described is enormously complex. And it seems to me like it's got to take a long, long time to work itself out. Would I think it takes time to work itself out. What I would have appreciated not at this end, the child that I raised is grown now, but what I would have appreciated early on is to have become aware of what I was getting into. I was just being, you know, that family member that was saying, you know, our family takes care of our own, but I didn't understand a lot of dynamics that come with this. Mm -hmm. um, I will admit that I have studied the work of Joseph Crumbly, Dr. Joseph Crumbly to learn more. Um, one of the things that he has been sharing recently that I hadn't thought about is the, the, the family tree, the genogram, how that changes drastically when you bring home your relative's child. So for instance, grandma and grandpa, they were grandma and grandpa, right? Now right. they are the parents of that child. Right. Now the birth parent are the siblings of that child. Everybody gets involved. And you're right, Jane. I just mentioned the birth parent, the kinship provider, and the child. But then we got all the rest of the relatives. There are aunts, uncles, cousins, all of those people, and they all got an opinion. Um, I have been impressed by colleagues of mine who I, I am a past member of the Grand Voices related to um, Generations United. They are an advocacy group. Um, with people all over the country. But I have been told stories about aunts and uncles. When the, grand, when the grandparents assume custody of the child, aunts and uncles sometimes are not, not pleased because the mm -hmm. relationship changes. Their children, who are the grandchildren as well, don't get as much attention. And there should be more understanding, but in a lot of instances, there, there risen. So there guilt, is. jealousy, all kinds of things say, why isn't he or she taking care of their own children? Why are you taking care of them? You know, mm -hmm. all of these things come up. Mm -hmm. Or even she will want that child to be taken care of this way and you're doing this and you're doing that. And it's like, look, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to make this work. You mm -hmm. know, so there's all of these things that come into play. Yeah. And it's it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah. I think conflict resolution um is something that is needed. But again, like I said, if I had more understanding when I walked into it about what was needed, I think I would have strategized a little bit differently. We're not ready for strategies yet, but we'll talk right. about that later. But you you raised a very valid point that if if people had more access to more information when they're in that situation, it would be very helpful. Yeah, because I would have negotiated a different contract with our wealthy. <laughs> mm. So we have a comment here about one thing I don't see is blame and shame. The comment blame and or shame should be there. Of feeling uh, judge, uh, feeling judgments that this person, the grandparent in this case, did not do a good job raising their own child. And if they, I assume if they did, they wouldn't be in the, their child would be able to raise their, uh, the grandchild. I think that's, that's a great point. Thank you, Kelly. You've heard of that term, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah. That is a term that a lot of people use and they shouldn't. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's, um, I'm. I'm gonna to move to the legal custody issue because I, I think our conversation is so rich. Um, and uh, often there is no legal custody, as you mentioned, when a grandparent or caregiver brings a child into their home, what would you see um, or how would you see this as a factor? Uh, and I think you've touched on some of that with more awareness of what you're getting yourself into, but do you want to comment more on that? Yeah, I, I would. So I was lucky in a lot of instances. I, I've got to say, I was just lucky. So um, the, ch the children in my life 
they had actually been adopted by my paternal aunt. And so she had put a lot of things in place that I just stepped into. A lot mm -hmm. of people don't have that. So in terms of her creating a situation that I just, just stepped into, there were resources that were available to me in that the child had Medicaid, okay? Um, and they say that whatever resources are attached to the child, go with the child. But that's not the case for most people. That's not the case for many people. Um, I live in North Carolina. I know that if you are not in the child welfare system, there are not gonna be any resources for you. So um, yeah. there, there could be, and not in all cases, there could be a need for financial resources. There could be a, a need for housing resources, clothing, food, sure. um, you know, all education, you know, the child may have special needs. Um, I was in a good spot for that because I had that already in place. Um, and so I was advised to go in and get guardianship. I could have gone in and gotten adoption. I did talk with the child in my life about that because I'm saying the child in my life and I mentioned three children. What happened for in our case was that we actually, there were three children, an extended family member took two of them and I took one of them because I couldn't have handled more than one. But um, she already had a child and we had a girl and two boys. She took the two boys with her. She already had a son. Um, and so we all got guardianship. Um, a lot of people, th that's not even on their mind. So for instance, mm -hmm. let's say aunt or uncle comes to visit their sibling. They find the sibling not there or in a state, maybe substance use. The children are walk, running around, you know, disheveled, haven't been clean, not sure if they've eaten. So the natural reaction is, let me take the kids home, let me do whatever. Um, and then they probably just keep the child. That's informal. There's nothing legal there. They have nothing to protect themselves in terms of taking care of that child. Um, if they um, call child welfare, child welfare will come in, the child will become a ward of the state. Um, then they can go through that system to kind of figure out who's going to get custody. That again would be under the discretion of child welfare because they would be making that decision. So you have either child welfare with the ward of the state, informal, where you have no um, benefits, going through court and becoming either a guardian or you adopt. Now, all of those, the, the, the legal stuff is expensive, especially if you um, do some private stuff. I've heard of people spending enormous amounts of money or some saying, I really wish I could do that, but I don't have any money to be able to do that. So people need to be able to go and figure out what's going to be best for them. There's no shame in that. Um, they have to do what's best for them. Again, at the bottom of this page is a um, resource on grandfamilies.org. And there is more specific information specifically about taking custody. Custody is a big yeah. thing. Again, it's big. In, in terms of school, in terms of medical care, dental care, all of that kind of stuff, you can't get in without paper. Not, not nowadays. Um, one of the questions, Jane, I'm skipping a little, but one of the questions um, that Jane is going to ask later on is about what's the difference between um, yesteryear and now? Well, the reality for me, part of, I guess, my rationale in terms of feeling that I needed to take care of our own was that my mother, my grandmother died when my mother was 10 years old. My mother just went to live with her aunt. She had to go through all of this. People didn't need all of this paperwork. You just went. But that's right. not the case anymore. Right, right. In terms of the custody issue, I think um, my experience is it brings into 
a spotlight on us, the dynamic between the grandparent and their child. Um, and I, I'm aware that in many instances, uh, the head of the grand family was reluctant to file custody or even guardianship um, because they feared that their child would uh, not agree or, or fight and that um, in the child's best interest, they did not bring it up. They, they were afraid to bring it up. And in some cases, I know there was threats of kidnapping the children and things like that, that it becomes that word custody uh, triggers a lot, even for a parent of children who may not, you know, by any measure be equipped to care for their child if they're threatened with somebody taking their children and can just um, erupt into major, major uh, issue. You know, so I see this in a couple of ways. I definitely hear what you're saying. And I, I actually know people that have gone through that. And it has been a thing of um, they had the child go to school. They right. go to school later on in the day, find that the child's not there. Where's the child? The, the birth parent decided they were going to take them. And, you know, there's a, a colleague, um, um, Joan Callender Dingle, I think I got her name correctly. She wrote a book um, about raising her grandchild. Um, what basically happened for her was that her, I think it was her daughter and her daughter's significant other, the father of the child were substance abusers. And so she, you know, took, she, she didn't want to, you know, she didn't want to, she didn't want to make it legal because, you know, this is beyond threats. There's still that thing of this is my child's child. And I don't want to, I don't want to interfere with them being a parent. Um, that whole thing, you, you don't want to take their name off the birth certificate, mm. which, you, which would happen with adoption. You don't want that to happen. This is your family member. You're hoping for the best for them. Right. But then Good the point. best may never happen. And that puts the child in jeopardy. But in Joan's yeah. particular case, what happened was the father came and took the child and then he was abusive towards the child. And so, mm -hmm. you know, there were all those extra feelings that she had about that. Another colleague of mine, he's up in um, Washington state. He was sharing with me that he had done all of this good work to stabilize his grandchild. And then the parent just came and just just took them, you know. And so there's there's a lot of feelings and thoughts that come with that. And please know that's not just for grandparents. Siblings feel that. Aunts and uncles feel that too. Mm -hmm. I even as a cousin felt that way, you know, because I was always trying to figure out how can we do this reunification thing. We had some other challenges that 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 prevented us from doing that early on, but. You know, it, it's, a, it's a struggle. And I think that you should be aware that families go through this. This is part of the family thing. That's why we need support. That's why we need support because we, we have the best intentions for everybody. We have the best intentions for the child. We also have the best intentions for the birth parent until they really piss us yeah. off. But we have the best intentions for everyone. Yeah. So um, I think there's been recently a lot of attention or awareness, shall I say, about um, grand families. However, I, I don't hear much about cultural or ethnic considerations when it comes to grand families. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I, I really do. So I have really, um, I learned more about it more. Um, and I know ICWA is, um, it may have already happened. Um, I haven't been paying as close of attention, but ICWA is the Indian Child Welfare Act. And mm -hmm. I know that it had become before the Supreme Court. What is supposed to happen is that Native American children are supposed to go back to their tribe. 
either the birth parents or someone in their culture. They're supposed to go back to them. And what has been happening is that that has not been what a number of child welfare agencies have been doing. And so that creates a lot of other issues. Um, I have to honor my Native American colleagues because they want to keep their children. They've already, you know, if you look back historically, because there's been a lot of stuff that happened historically in terms of children being taken away from their families, people being taken away from their tribal nations. And so they want their children to be with them. They want to teach their children their customs, their ways. In a lot of instances, Native American, some of the Native American groups have lost their, lost their um, language, lost their, some of their tribal customs. They want that to continue. So I, I can honor that. Um, the same type of thing in terms of um, Latino children. So I know a couple of years ago here in North Carolina, you know, I was hearing that, you know, ch parents were being deported and then the children were being put into foster care, right? And so that meant that then the children were open for adoption and the family, the, the Latino families could lose relationship with their, mm -hmm. their, their family members. African-Americans, mm -hmm. again, that history in terms of, it's connected to slavery um, in terms of how things happen um, with the children. So there's a lot of different dynamics. I put up um, these three volumes for people to learn more because no, I don't have all the answers. Um, I don't have most of them, but here's three resources from Grand Family, I mean, from Generations United. And now you know what they look like um, that you can go to to get more information about these specific cultures. Mm -hmm. I think you also mentioned uh, in one of our conversations about um, African-American families, the custody or having their children in the system is particularly um, um, something to avoid, I guess. So, you know, um, so um, it was stated earlier, my background um, in terms of being a counselor. Um, some of the work that I did as a counselor, I used to work for Duke University. They had a perinatal substance abuse program, perinatal being pregnant and postpartum substance abuse women. And um, I remember conversations that I had with colleagues um, who were working for child welfare. I'm going to be honest, they were African-American colleagues and they were Make it, telling me about the distinctions that were made between African-American children and white children in terms of um, child placements and different things that were happening to those children. When it came time for me to make that decision, those memories were in my mind in terms of this is my cousin. No, I, I just don't want her just anywhere with anybody not knowing What's going to happen with them? Not knowing, do they care about her education? Do they care about her health care? Do they care about all of these things? Um, one of the things that I did um, a number of years ago, I used to work for um, CASA, the Center for um, Addiction and Substance Abuse Treatment. They have changed their name now. I can't remember what the new name is. But um, we were dealing with um, children in, I one of my projects was dealing with child welfare in the DC metro area. And I would hear the stories of some of the people that had been through the child welfare system. Um, one of my colleagues had a program called the National, I can't remember the exact name of it. Anyway, the gist of the organization was that um, older people, these were adults, he was a friend of mine, my age, um, that had gone through the foster care system were teaching um, young people in the foster care system trades and what have you. They were providing housing and mental health care and all those kind of things because children were going through the foster care system and they weren't getting 
they weren't they weren't getting what they needed. Um, I think in Catawba County in North Carolina, they had because um, I I start I start I had to do it too. Suitcases for kids. They told me the stories about you know, child welfare came in. Um, they put all the child's belongings in a trash bag. Can you imagine your belongings in a trash bag? You know, that makes you think they're going out to the dumpster. Um, they lose all of that to go to people that really don't want them, don't care about them. Um, that That's not true of all foster care. So let me give that disclaimer. But, you know, people are shuffled around over and over and over and over again. One of the things that we know in terms of grand families, children are more likely to stay with their relatives. Gen, you know, children in the foster care system, you, you read all of these stories. I read one just the other day about an eight-year-old that had had 23 placements. Mm -hmm. Go to live with your relative. Generally, relatives are gonna keep you. Generally, relatives are gonna keep you or they're gonna to try to get you with another relative that can. So there's more stabilization there. But all of those things, historically, we know in terms of the African-American culture, the labor force, you know, they're, they're put out there not without child labor laws doing all kinds of things. So all of those things come into your mind um, and they're not just, you know, fantasies. They're, a lot of these things have actually happened. And so they stay in my mind in terms of being concerned and, and families do care. One of the things that people need to hear is that generally families step up to the plate for their relatives' children, not to enter the child welfare system, but to take care of the child. Care. They're not stepping up to say, oh yeah, I want to join the child welfare system. I want my child to be a ward of the state. That's not why they're doing it. So there's a need to support them. We'll talk about support, but there's a need to support them so that they can provide the best for the children. In terms of healthcare, they're gonna do that. In terms of making sure that they get the educational direction, they're gonna do that. I remember the story of Jamie Foxx. I've been checking into celebrities who have gone through gone through um, and lived with relatives. His grandmother busted her butt. I think she was a domestic, but she busted her butt so that he could get piano lessons and explore his talents and do those kind of things. Other people don't generally do that. Family does that for you. Family does that. Mm -hmm. We had a wonderful example of the Olympic gymnast Simone Biles, yes, right, exactly. Right. There's a whole list of people. You're right. You're right. So, uh, but you, we touched on parenting, um, and so grand, heads of grand families may have been out of, may, well, may never have, or may have not parented for, you know, 10, 15, or 20 years, and yet find themselves now dealing in a whole new world of parenting. Um, so what do you see as some of these uh, stressors that um, so, might be you know, different? Understanding, understanding um, what you need to do. So for instance, I was a latchkey kid. I was a latchkey kid. When I was six years old, I went to first grade. I knew how to get home. Me and I had walked home with somebody, had my key. I knew that I was supposed to come into that house, take off my school clothes, put on my play clothes, and I was supposed to get hit the books. I was supposed to study. I wasn't the only latchkey kid in my generation. I'm thinking a lot of grandparents are like me. They don't know all of these new rules in terms of um, you can't have latchkey kids anymore. They, they, I read somewhere, it was recently, within the last week or so, I heard about a parent getting in trouble because the 14-year-old child was taking care of the siblings. Mm -hmm. folk, folk, folks don't know all of these new rules. Um, in terms of things, in terms of school, for instance, my child came home many times and told me 
she didn't have homework. And when I checked in with this teacher, she didn't have homework. And I was like, well, wait, what do you mean we don't have homework? Everybody has homework. You have to have homework. That's how you learn. You have projects that you do, all kinds of things that you, you need to do. All of that has changed. Needing to have computers as you go to school. Children need those. People now have cell phones. Cell phones can create other problems, in my opinion. But, you know, there are all of these new kinds of things. We've already talked about the paperwork in terms of going to the doctor and, and going to the dentist <laughs> and all of that. But even, you know, things in terms of trips at school, a whole new world. This was not the way things were when, when we were younger. You know what? We got a chat box and there are people that are here making comments. I want y'all to tell us how has the world changed in the last 20 years? Y'all can say something. By the way, I, we, we've it. had good <laughs> comments in here. Um, and uh, the last one, I think, trauma, trauma, trauma. Trauma, is, trauma, just, trauma. Is weeping. And in, um, nobody is immune from it in this situation, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, yeah, but life has changed drastically. And I think mm -hmm. that families need to have a catch up. You know, um, even if this is something that I didn't know that I've learned from um, colleagues that have um, have had, had children in the child welfare system. So I thought you in the child welfare system, everything is fine. I have found out that some people got in trouble because they didn't have certain things in the house. They needed to have certain mm -hmm. sleeping arrangements. They, um, yes, yeah, social media, I saw that one, um, Eula. Um, they needed certain sleeping arrangements, certain fire hoses, different kinds of things. Families may not be prepared for all of that. You know, mm -hmm. that you, a lot of instances, you don't even do that for your own children. It's not something that, that you think about, but, You've got a legal entity now saying you've got to do all of this. So, so it's new information. You, you don't know. Yeah. Who would have told you? That's not one of the things that we have generally as part of our discussion. It's mm -hmm. not. Even in What's, a small community nowadays, you can't trust those people in your community. So, oh, girl, Holly, that's correct. You can't, you can't trust people necessarily to watch out for your children, um, they aren't as informed even with all the technology these days. Unfortunately, that's true, but I don't think that's new. I think that there's always been some folks that you couldn't trust with your children. I think the whole issue of technology is a huge one. It's in scary. that I just watching, being aware of what kids are. Um, Watching. watching, listening to, talking to, um, and how much screen time and being able to control the screen time is, is a huge, huge uh, issue. So there's a lot of, and also I think even uh, dress or um, relationships as ch children grow into adolescence uh, and um, well, even before adolescence, even before, yeah, children get involved with a lot of this very early on in terms yeah. of relationships. You yeah. know, instead of playing with their dolls and their trucks, they're you know engaging right. in more things. And then the substance use, the substance use. Yes, that's another one. Yes. Yeah. Right. And a lot, particularly. And then, I in some it, communities, it, there's also gangs. Yes. Oh, gosh, yes. But I think particularly if there's a history of their parent with substance use, um, that can be a risk factor for sure. It is. So, and one of the things that I learned the hard way, Jane, was um, so my child, um, her mother had a history of, in, of addiction and incarceration. And I remember she came home from school so frustrated. There had been a presenter that had come in 
and talked with um, her class about substance abuse prevention. And they painted people who were addicted to drugs in a very negative way, mm -hmm. in a very negative way. And so I saw how that changed her willingness to listen to people because she knew her mother, she loved her mother, her mother loved her. To hear that her mother is a bad person is not the picture to paint to, for a child. It, you, you just don't do that. So, um, you know, and, and even in school, um, th th there are so many things that you need to look at in terms of what you are communicating to children. What do you communicate when you, you say, you know, it's Mother's Day and, oh, you don't have a mother? Oh, you don't have a father? Right. Um, we're having a daddy-daughter dance. You don't have anybody to bring with you? Mm. You know, there's all of these. Yeah. Someone said it earlier, shame and blame. Yeah. 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 And unfortunately, I think our last two years of COVID have increased the number of children who have lost a parent and maybe in, uh, being raised by uh, a, in a grand family situation. So there's any number of, of reasons. Um, you've yeah. mentioned schools or we've mentioned schools a couple of times. How do you feel schools could be more supportive of grand families or, or, or the children that are in grand families? Are there any things ways schools could really? Yeah, I'm thinking about <clears throat> a young um, child, she, she was in preschool that I came to know, not my child. Um, and she was in a grand family. She had, I believe, a teacher that was pretty understanding. I, I don't think most people could have dealt with her. Um, there were times when she came to class so angry, I mean, just angry and unable. I, I, some people would say unwilling, but I say unable to take in the information mm -hmm. that the teacher was sharing on that particular day. So mm -hmm. I think um, among other things that, especially since we're talking about young children, we need to have people within our school systems that have some understanding of grand families, first off, mm -hmm. um, and how that impacts a child. Young children, young children can't mm -hmm. communicate. They, can't, they don't know how to communicate. I'm having a bad day today and I need to have some time out in your corner, please. They're not gonna say that. Instead, there's going to be probably some acting out or there's going to be um, some level of them internalizing things. Sometimes you just need to check in. Hopefully you know the young people in your classroom and let them have some time to themselves. Mm -hmm. We have school counselors, we have school social workers, we have school psychologists. No, we don't want to pathologize. We, uh, my, my, my tongue got tied. So we don't want to pathologize everything. We all have bad days, but understand that these children may have more bad days than not, and they can easily be triggered. So this particular child I'm thinking about, she had rough time for Valentine's Day, her mother's birthday, Mother's Day, Father's Day. Those were triggers for her seeing the other children in her pre-K class with mommy and daddy giving them hugs and what have you. And she knows she lived with her grandma. You know, mm -hmm. those are all triggers. So having some empathy and understanding, okay, this is hard for you. And mm -hmm. maybe helping her to develop a language. So I know um, they've got these various um, programs in school right now because I'm trying to think of it. One of my favorite ones is, is escaping me right now. But people have time out little areas where they can go in and kind Safe of just space. read. Mm -hmm. Other programs have time where children are, learn, 
are, are taught yoga, how to do some deep breathing, calm yourself, settle yourself, say, I need a few minutes, you know, those kind of things. But we need to have, um, we need to have our health and human service professionals to be more understanding. You do have those school counselors in school, use them. That's what they're there for. Use them to do different things, um, to help the child learn how to express him or herself. Um, having things, you know, um, sand trays or, or different kinds of things where the child can feel textures or whatever. Teaching our children, as anybody know that, um, know that uh, exercise now that they do with the, with the brain in terms of teaching trauma and how to um, regulate your brain, teaching young people those kinds of skills, um, resilient skills. You can do that with a child as young as, you know, in the third or the fourth grade, mm -hmm. but teaching mm -hmm. them those kinds of things. Don't just teach it to them, also teach their parents, the person who is parenting them. Because when the child comes home and the child says, okay, this is my brain and I'm having this feeling and I need to do this, it needs to be continued. <laughs> Whatever you taught them, it needs to right. be continued at home, right? Yeah. 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 Good point. So I'm looking at our time and um, I really want to get to programs and policies. Um, such an important, and I'll just kind of start that discussion by talking about our, our previous question about schools and how often these policies in schools or state and federal policies prohibit schools from serving children or accessing health care because of the paperwork, right? because of the paperwork. There's a lot of paperwork. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, you know, that's part of what we need to, 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 to think about. We need to, make, we need to make our service providers, our service facilities more family friendly. Mm -hmm. They need to be more family friendly. Um, how to do all of that. So, oh, I've fallen apart here, excuse me. <laughs> My light fell, but... Um, Jane, you, I think, would know more about that because you are dealing with all of these um, organizations with Fred. Lowe. What do y'all do? Well, I, and I think I would like to actually bring up at this point, the there is a National Advisory Council, um, a Grandparents Raising Grandchildren Advisory Council, and yeah. I think one of our members may be on online. Sarah Smalls, are you on? Yes, I am. So Great. can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I know you are a part of that. Right. <laughs> and so they, they've come up with a series of recommendations around program and policy issues. Sarah, maybe you'd like to turn your camera on and say a few words about that. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Smalls, and I am a uh, GRANDS member. Linda and I know each other, and um, I am also um, a member of that particular advisory council, uh, Jane. There are a number of suggestions in that report. It is a very long and valued report that we all put, all of us, all meaning those of us on the council, um, put ideas into. And um, I've been listening intently at Glenda and, and so well spoken about what grand families are and what they go through. Um, I think perhaps there are too many, of course, for me to mention, but the, the exact question you asked was, Jane, again. Um, well, it, the policy recommendations um, and they were divided into uh, a few areas, uh, grand family care, caregiver engagement, uh, awareness of out, and outreach to uh, grand families and um, services, I believe. Yeah, services and support for grand families, 
um, financial and workplace security for uh, kinship and grand families yes. and data and evidence supported practices. We're, we're um, I don't know, Pamela, can you put the link in the recommendation, the final recommendations came out in October of 2020. Mm -hmm. Thanks to people like Sarah on the on the committee. Um, and I think they really are comprehensive and really speak to uh, multiple levels that need to occur. This type of webinar being one to raise awareness and also um, to then connect fam grand families uh, to services and supports around the country. Yes. And, and um, financial. Uh, supports as well. It depends upon what state you live in. Uh, yes. for, um, in particular, I am in Northern Virginia and Virginia is, I always say not a kinship state. I think Glenda knows what I mean by that. There are no payments for kinship caregivers mm -hmm. unless uh, you're in the foster care system. I happen to be one of those that is outside of the foster care system. They call them formal and informal. I am informal. Formal mm -hmm. comes out of the foster care system and there may be some type of monetary payment that you could get from that, but it all depends on, there are some states who have monetary payments, Maine, um, a couple of others um, that have very good, and I actually DC, though not a state, they do have, um, uh, more than just resources for uh, kinship caregivers. They actually give uh, a certain amount of monies. Um, there are resources uh, in various states for kinship caregivers, but of course it's too much to go through um, the right. report. You would have to look, look at the report. And, um, but if you're in the state of Virginia, I can certainly, um, if one wants to reach out uh, to me, I'd certainly, be able to talk with you, you email you, or what have you. And there are others in Generations United Grants um, mm -hmm. who I can reach out to if you're in how, another. How many of you, I think there are about um, four or five of you that are part of that committee. Um, so um, it's you, Sonia. Yeah, there, there's more than four or five, I think. Um, okay. But at least, at least six, I believe it is, you know. Okay. There are others in other states that I can reach out to and get assistance as well as Glenda could too. You know, yeah. she is a previous member of um, grants. Um, I'm still involved with them, very involved with them and was on this um, advisory council and work with them on a weekly basis. So um, I'd be happy to uh, give my email address or put it in the put it in the chat and you so what she's sharing is that that grand voices group for generations united can be very useful to people yeah. they it's are powerful. connected so i know right. that you've got a colorado representative you've got yeah. a Mar maryland representative who yes. also represents native american community you've got a minnesota representative yes. but on if you go to generations united uh, well, let's not go to Generations United. That may not be where it is. If you Google it search is. brand is. voices, mm -hmm. you will be able to see who the representatives are mm -hmm. for each state. And hopefully that person, some more than others, because Sarah is more involved. All of them are not um, as involved as Sarah is. But um, most of them are doing a lot within their states and can provide you with guidance in terms of what is going on in your state. On this document here, I did go ahead and put um, the um, email address, uh, not the email address, the URL for, you can see it on this slide, for that um, report that Jane was talking about. And there's mm -hmm. also a handout that I emailed to someone, I'm hoping we'll be able to pull that yeah. up now, or at least, email it out to people. After. We definitely yeah. will. Yeah, we will. Yeah. And just, um, yeah. I, I think we're out of time, but this has right. been such an amazingly rich conversation. Um, 
Dr. Claire, Sarah, Jane, and all the all the folks. Dr. Claire very oh, kindly you. let a lot of folks in her network know about this. So we had yes. great attendance. It was great uh, back and forth in the chat. So I really appreciate everyone's participation. Our colleague Joanne just put into the chat a link to a survey. We really love to provide provide these services free of charge. I mean, this webinar and training opportunities free of charge. Please fill out the survey, um, you know, so that we can get feedback about this that we can share with our funder. Um, and just thank you so much. We will follow up with an email we'll, with the, with the, the handout. Yeah, the yeah. handout that Dr. Claire kindly put together uh, for us and the resources and then the additional resources that folks shared in the chat. There's just a really a lot of great stuff that folks were sharing. I'm sorry that we didn't get a chance to kind of share more of the perspectives of some of our participants, but maybe this just means that we need some follow up programming about this topic since it was such yeah. a rich conversation today and we had such great comments. So I just want to thank you again, Dr. Claire and Jane. This was amazing. Thank, thank you. And Sarah's Dr. going to put her email in the chat. Uh, yes, I will. I will, but I, I think I already put my info in there, but I will do it now. Okay. All right. So thank, thank you, you for everybody. Us. Thank you, Dr. Claire, for your um, really, really um, sincere, heartfelt uh, sharing of your experiences along with sharing of your expertise. We're very grateful. And again, to all of you for sharing part of your day with us. Thank you so much. Please complete the survey if you can. And you'll be receiving an email tomorrow with additional resources and the, the handout from Dr. Claire and the PowerPoint. So have a good evening, all. Thank all right. you. Bye -bye. Take care, everyone. Thanks a bunch.